So in 1990, you were sentenced to six and a third to 19 years. At this time, you were actually sent to a maximum security prison called Eastern, and you were placed in a cell next to Ronnie DeFeo, the Amityville horror. What did he say to you? you just wave and say, hey, neighbor? Yeah, he. Uh, as soon as I seen him, he said, hi, neighbor. Welcome to Happy Nap, because they call it Napanak. Uh, it's in Napanak, New York. They call it Napanak or Eastern. Now... Uh, in a TV interview, he, he had claimed that all the guards and inmates were scared to death of him. Did you find that to be true? Uh, no. First of all, Ronnie was five foot eight, 150 pounds. He was basically a loner and he was very mellow. Um, he was on psych medications. At nighttime, a guard would say over the intercom, last call on the alcohol. Like as a joke, it was for meds and people would run and get their Prozac or Ritalin. And Ronnie was one of them. So he was constantly on medication. He was not violent. He had no fights. He didn't really have too many arguments in there. So were there any actual interactions between Ronnie and other inmates? Oh, yeah. Uh, first of all, I locked to, let's see, I guess the right side of Ronnie. And on the other side of Ronnie was a biker. Uh, I don't know if he was Hell's Angel or what. His name was Big John Parker. Uh, John had a murder in New York. He was he was serving 20 to life. He also had a murder charge in Florida and I think three murders in Texas that he had to go when he was finished with New York. And he was about 6'5", about 300-something pounds, all muscle, worked out every day. And... One day I see he 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 made a painting and it looked like a seven year old painted this painting. And he walks over to Ronnie and says, here, Ronnie, 50 bucks. And I did this for you. And Ronnie just put his head down and, you know, rolled it up and put it in his cell. So you could say the guy was extorting Ronnie. You know, every two weeks or so, he would draw a painting that looked like a five year old did. Give it to Ronnie. And I guess Ronnie would have someone sent fifty dollars to his account that that was one interaction that he had now he had been at the albany medical center when he was declared dead on march 12th 2021 prison officials did not reveal why he had been there in the first place or what his cause of death was uh, they couldn't release the cause of death you know to anybody except his relatives because of the privacy laws health privacy laws it's still a mystery what his cause of death was did you, you know, do you have any, can you shed any light on this? Uh, I think I can. Um, first of all, as far as the pr health privacy laws go, it was probably HIV. And, you know, I knew Ronnie. I was locked next to him for about maybe a year and a half, and then they moved me somewhere else. And Ronnie uh, fell in love with another inmate, a man who, you know, uh, acted, I guess, like uh, tried to look like a woman, real ugly, real skinny, had scabs on, on him. And they call the inmates called him Bones. He was so skinny. But Ronnie referred to this inmate as Jessica. And Ronnie fell in love with this Jessica. And I remember one day, you know, a bunch of guys used to go to the um, church on on Saturday night. The Reverend was a pretty good guy. And, you know, after mass, in the back of the church, he would have like a big thing of coffee and some Enemans cakes and we'd watch a movie. So, you know, a lot of white guys, they'd hang out there, you know, after church on Saturday. And one night, Ronnie was in the back of the church. He wanted to, you know, last seats with this Jessica, whatever bones. And what happened was uh, Ronnie was having, um, getting oral sex from this inmate who most likely had AIDS. And he, he, um, you know, he, he was a strange guy, you know, uh, I, I believe he must've contacted that from, you know, that inmate, you know, he uh, was also, he was also, uh, married a couple of times, like two or three times. And the women were pretty good looking college educated. And, you know, for whatever reason, they get attracted to like serial killers and, stuff of that nature and plus another fact was ronnie had a lot of money um 
I think after his parents died, they must have left life insurance policies or, you know, whatever money they had from owning or operating a Buick dealership. And I think all the money went to his grandparents and his grandparents still uh, basically stood by his side or supported him. So there was always money out there somewhere. Did anybody else question why you were in prison with serial killers and these mass murderers? When all you were convicted of, you know, falsely was a quarter gram of coke. Uh, yeah, it was actually less than a quarter gram. It was a yeah. uh, trace. Yeah. Um, first of all, the inmates did. We were walking around the yard in Eastern Prison one time, and a lot of guys used to walk miles at night. And um, one day, an inmate says, I, I killed two people. Ronnie killed six people. And we're standing next to a guy who got caught with a quarter gram of cocaine in a maximum security prison. And they all started laughing. I was looking at the barbed wire and the 40 foot wall and saying, you know, what the hell am I doing here? Then on another occasion, um, a guard that I worked for over there, like in the mess hall, he must have said, you know, he used to look up people's records to see what they were in there for, if they're in there for something bad or whatever. And he must have looked up my record and seen that, I, you know, I only had one felony conviction and it was for intent to sell a misdemeanor worth of cocaine. And he, he said to me one day, he said, he said, Vito, what the hell are you doing in here? You know, I said, uh, I got a bad break. Uh, you know, I was in Nassau County and, you know, besides, you know, being innocent, I, they really, uh, the sentence doesn't fit the crime, you know? So I, 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 I was on, in South Hall alone, um, Ronnie DeFeo had six murders. Um, Big John Parker, the biker who was extorting Ronnie, had at least four bodies that he was caught for. And there was other people there that had a body or two or three. And uh, I, I, I really didn't fit in there. When he said to me, you know, uh, hi, neighbor, you know, welcome to Happy Nap. I thought to myself, is this a bad dream or something? Yeah, sure. You know, one one other thing I want to say, a couple other things I want, like to say about Ronnie, um, maybe I should have done it in a certain order. I remember the first year I was there, I got there in 1990, and about two months later, Ronnie DeFeo comes over to me and other people start shaking everybody's hand. And he says, uh, I'm going back to court. My case got reversed, and uh, I, I, I'm going to be a free man. He, and... Uh, I went to a guy, Charlie, I knew. He was in the prison a long time. I said, Charlie, you know, the enemy of horror just told everybody he's going home, that his case was, you know, reversed. And he said, that guy's out of his mind. He's psychotic. He said he does that every year. He's been doing that for the last 15 years. You know, he had, he had so many stories about, you know, what happened. First, he claimed that he alone murdered his family. Then later he claimed that his sister Dawn began, you know, the killing spree and he just killed his father. Then there was the accomplice theory that there was up to two other accomplices. Then mafia hitman wiped out his family. His story kept changing and changing. He was definitely a, definitely a strange guy. Definitely. Uh, I think he was, uh, I think he was abused by maybe his father beat up or whatever, but you know, to do what he did, you know, was a mixture of, I think, you know, drugs that he was on and uh, probably uh, child abuse. I think he, was, he had to be sexually molested or something, you know, to go in jail like a man. And, you know, he could have a wife and yet he claims to, you know, he, he, he clings to like, you know, men in prison who are trying to be women. And it was like him and it was like Damodville Horror met the Bride of Frankenstein. When was the last time you saw him, Ronnie? Like, how did he go out? Um, Ronnie was in, Ronnie was in a lot of prisons. He was in, uh, I believe Greenhaven. He was in, um, Sullivan, uh, with, with, uh, David Berkowitz, the son of Sam. He was in Eastern a, at least a couple of years. I don't know how many years. And he, he got moved around, you know, um, as most inmates do, they keep you in a place a couple of years and they move you on somewhere else. Um, the last time I seen him was uh, probably around the middle of 1992. So I I, I, I I was with him maybe maybe close to two years. Yeah, well, you yeah. know, what I told you was basically new stuff about him, you know, um, yeah. just about how, how he was in jail. And, you know, he was getting extorted by this this guy in a very subtle way. 
he was very violent, this guy, but he was very calm and subdued too. But he was a, a big boy, you know, 6'5", 300 some pounds. And like I said, he just draw these paintings and walk up to Ronnie and say, here, Ronnie, uh, 50 bucks. And Ronnie would always just put his head down and, you know, roll the thing up and throw it in his cell. And probably when nobody was around, he probably threw it in the garbage. I'm surprised he had the money for that. But if you're saying he kind of had these women contacting him, you think they were giving him money? No, I think he, I think he, he, he had given the women some money. I, I, I believe I, I heard he also had two kids with one of the women. Um, uh, he told me the kids' names. Uh, I think Daniel. I think he said he had a son, Daniel, or something. Uh, I, I don't really remember. Hmm. He he told me he had kids. I don't know from where or before. Um, no, uh, Ronnie had money from his grandparents. That was what I heard. He didn't really talk about money or anything, but he always had money, you know, for whatever he needed or wanted. And uh, I guess John Parker seen that and Ronnie, and you know, instead of you know trying getting any waves or getting into a fight. He probably figured it was just easy to give this guy, you know, fifty dollars every two weeks, which uh, was his commissary money. Yeah, no, that you know that inheritance. I'm surprised the government just didn't take like they took from Sonny. Well, yeah, I mean, not that Sonny had inheritance, but the court costs and lawyers and restitution and fines. First of all, Ronnie, I, I believe he had court-appointed attorneys. You know, a murder trial is a lot of money and stuff like that. I believe he had court-appointed attorneys and. He fired one and got another one, what have you. He didn't get any money under the Son of Sam law. He he couldn't get any money from the books or, you know, TV movies or television series. And there was a lot of books and a lot of different versions yeah. about the house, the house being, you know, haunted or, you know, possessed. Uh, and that really burnt Ronnie. He never got any, he never seen a dime. Everybody made money off his story. Some people exaggerated the story or made up stories or told the true story. And he never seen a dime from it. But his grandparents had a lot of money. And, you know, both of his grandparents uh, on his mother's side and father's side, they were involved with the mob. I believe the Genovese crime family. And they had a Buick dealership. And I think Ronnie's father had run, run the dealership. And uh, he didn't get any money from his family or, or stuff like that. I mean, his, you know, immediate family, but his, his grandparents were there for him. Gotcha. All right, cool. Thanks, All right. Greg. All right, Nick, Talk thanks. Talk to you soon.